Good morning, everyone. Are we ready to get started? My name is Gina Montes. I'm one of the deputy city managers, and I'm happy to see everyone here this uh, sunny Monday morning. Um, welcome to everyone to today's budget hearing for the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 city budget. The feedback we received today is extremely important as we formulate the proposed budget to present to city council. So your input may be considered before the budget is approved. The proposed budget will be presented to city council on May 2nd and voted on on May 16th. If you wish to speak at today's hearing on the proposed budget, please fill out a comment card. For those of you who may have comments but do not wish to speak today, you can fill out a comment card and check the box, I do not wish to speak. Another way to participate is through the Fund Phoenix interactive budget tool. This tool lets you provide direct feedback on the proposed budget and is available at phoenix.gov backslash budget. Today we have a short 10 minute video to show you on the proposed trial budget. The video also includes information on a proposed general obligation bond program approved by the City Council in December 2022. The proposed GEO bond program is not subject to change and today's video is for information purposes only. The GEO bond program requires voter appro approval and will be on the November 7, 2023 ballot for consideration. And I'll turn it over to Councilman Saldesicio. Uh, thank you, Gina, and thank you, staff, for being here. If you're a staff member with the City of Phoenix, we always make sure we have everybody here from almost every department so that if any questions come up, you're able to get directed immediately and get the help that you need immediately. Uh, who from staff is here? If you could raise your hand so people could look around. Okay, there you go. Thank you for that. Uh, this is your budget. Uh, this is your opportunity to be able to speak and talk about what it is you'd like to do. The trial budget is nothing more than a trial budget that fits in fiscally within the city of Phoenix's confines of our budget. So from your end of it, if you want to redirect some of those funds, this is the time to talk about that. And then I'm going to introduce Kevin Robinson as well. He's the newly elected individual. If we could give him a hand. Kevin got elected, and I'm going to turn this over to him as well, too. Uh, he's going to be in charge of these meetings going forward for the next four years, and maybe eight years, or maybe 12 years. It depends on what he decides to do. Uh, you're going to enjoy it, Kevin. It's been an amazing ride. Uh, it's something that you're going to be able to have an impact on, and you're going to do an amazing job. Kevin and I used to be neighbors. I think three or four homes, yeah, several years. The best neighbor you could ever have. He was amazing. Um, and he takes that type of level of kindness and compassion uh, to the way he does everything that he does. And he's very thoughtful. He's one of, the, one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. So I want to congratulate you for all the work that you've done, Kevin, for the city. And I'm going to turn this over to you, too. Oh, thank you very much and good morning. I, and I want to take the opportunity to uh, thank Councilman DeCicio, who has served District 6 in the city of Phoenix for more than 15 years, almost 20 years. And um, he had it a little backwards. He was the best neighbor to ever have. So um, with that, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm looking forward to serving the residents of District 6 as well as the city of Phoenix as a whole. So thank you very much for inviting me to sit up here today. You thank you. All right. We'll go ahead and get started with the video presentation. Or to Gina. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Speaking to Oh, absolutely. Before we begin the video, I'd like to introduce our interpreter, Carmen Cota, for today's hearing. Carmen, are you going to introduce yourself? I think we need the... No, okay. All right, then we'll go ahead and start the video. The City of Phoenix trial budget for fiscal year 2023-2024 proposed by the Phoenix City Manager is ready for public review and comment. A trial budget is a rough draft of the actual budget, estimating how much money and how it will be used for the next fiscal year. How does Phoenix's annual budget work? The city budget is made up of three parts, the general fund, enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. The general fund is made up of city sales tax, property taxes, revenue distributed by the state from income tax, sales and vehicle license taxes, and some fines and fees. 
The general fund supports many of the services our residents, visitors, and businesses have come to expect in Phoenix, such as libraries, parks, senior and youth programs, police and fire services, and more. Enterprise funds are those city departments that only charge the people who use their services directly, like water and sewer, airlines and passengers at Sky Harbor, and trash and recycling customers. Finally, special revenue funds reserved for specific purposes from grants and voter approved sales taxes dedicated for parks and preserves, transportation, and public safety. That's how Phoenix gets its money. Now, how do we spend it? Phoenix has a long history of responsible budgeting, ensuring resources are balanced to projected expenses each fiscal year. A top priority of the City Council is to ensure the public can engage in the budget development process every year, giving the community a voice in the future of our city. Residents have multiple opportunities to provide their input ahead of final budget decision making scheduled for May 16th. Each year, departments look at what it will take to provide services for the upcoming year and staff forecast what resources will be available to pay for services. The city manager then proposes a trial budget in March each year that identifies how resources should best be allocated to achieve city council and community priorities. Then we ask for your input at community budget hearings in April each year by using the Fun Phoenix interactive budget tool available in English and Spanish or by contacting the city directly to ensure the budget reflects the priorities of our residents and city council. After receiving your input, the city council will vote on the budget in May and legally adopt the budget in June each year. State law requires the city's budget to be balanced each year. And this year, we are happy to report a projected budget surplus of $134 million. This is thanks to Phoenix's continued strong economy and sound fiscal leadership from the mayor and city council. For fiscal year 2023-24, the proposed general fund trial budget proposes to allocate the surplus primarily to address employee compensation. The city is experiencing significant vacancies across all city departments due to the competitive labor market and increases are necessary so we can ensure our most valuable asset is paid competitively and positions can be filled with the best talent available to deliver services to you. This year's trial budget also includes $14 million in general fund money proposed to programs and services in city council and community priority areas. Focus area one, continuing services for vulnerable populations. To ensure vulnerable populations can continue receiving vital services that are at risk due to expiring or reduced grant funding and increase resources used to help individuals experiencing homelessness, substance abuse, and behavioral health issues, $7.4 million is proposed to support the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, Victims Advocacy Services, and expand the Behavioral Health Engagement Team's contract. The funds proposed would also expand the Phoenix Cares Outreach Program to increase resources focusing on targeted areas in the city with high concentrations of encampments requiring cleanup and continue operations next fiscal year at shelters serving 420 individuals per night and approximately 1,300 each year. Focus Area 2, Enhancing Public Safety Responsiveness and Criminal Justice. To help improve emergency response times across the city, $3.5 million is proposed for the Phoenix Fire Department for an additional rescue unit and to fully staff a new fire station located at 19th Avenue and Chandler Boulevard. As part of the Phoenix Police Department's focus on civilianization efforts, new positions are included for civilian investigators and police assistants within the department, along with training and crime scene specialists. Costs will be absorbed in the existing police department operating budget for fiscal year 2023-24. This proposal also includes additional resources for the law department to replace grant funding that will be reduced next fiscal year used to provide services to victims of crime. Focus area three, healthy neighborhoods and community enrichment. To expand the city's efforts toward equity and arts, $125,000 is proposed to increase funding for the community arts grants program 
that supports renters at Herberger Theater Center and other local venues. Also, a new project manager position to help manage and coordinate the Office of Arts and Culture's model for involving artists in designing and building a better city. The cost for this position will be paid for with existing capital project funds. A proposed $571,000 for the Neighborhood Services Department would add funding to expand the Gated Alley program, providing resources to install approximately 77 new gated alley segments each year and restore two grant-funded neighborhood inspector positions to the general fund, which will free up grant resources used to serve low and moderate income residents. In an effort to increase park security and advance the city's climate action plan, $2 million is proposed for the Parks and Recreation Department to hire 14 park rangers and one park manager to create two urban park ranger teams that will work overnight. The addition of an overnight third shift will provide coverage 24 hours per day, seven days a week at city parks. The proposed funds will also add more staff to expand tree planting and shade canopy efforts citywide and add a new volunteer coordinator to assist in the coordination of volunteer efforts throughout city parks. Non-general fund supplementals total $1.4 million. Due to growth and security needs at the airport, $917,000 is proposed for two new access agents for badging services and to add vehicles needed for the airport bureau. $488,000 is proposed to support technology and streamlining of services provided by the Planning and Development Department, including managing the Shape Phoenix permitting system, enhanced electronic plan review, and staff to support increased human resource activity. In addition, $1 million is reserved for possible changes to the trial budget based on resident feedback on the budget and five million dollars will go to the general fund contingency or rainy day fund to ensure resources are available in the event of unexpected economic or financial events this has been just a taste of what you will find in the 2023-24 city of phoenix proposed trial budget more information on the proposed budget is available at our website phoenix.gov slash budget. We encourage you to provide your input using Fund PHX, an interactive budget tool available in English and Spanish that lets you provide direct feedback on the proposed fiscal year 2023-24 trial budget additions. We hope that you'll review additional details in the budget tabloid available at each budget hearing in English and Spanish and online at phoenix.gov slash budget. Please share your feedback in whatever way works best for you at one of the community budget hearings or by email at budget.research at phoenix.gov. You can comment on the city's social media pages at City of Phoenix AZ on Facebook or on Twitter using hashtag PHXBudget or call us at 602-262-4800. All resident feedback will be shared with the city council so they may consider it before making final budget decisions. The city manager will present his proposed budget for 2023-2024 to the Phoenix City Council on May 2nd, 2023. The council's budget decision will take place on May 16th. 2023. Thank you for being a part of this important process. We look forward to hearing your ideas for this year's trial budget and the future of Phoenix. And now to an informational update on the City Council approved 2023 General Obligation Bond Program. In December, the City Council approved a General Obligation Bond Program to advance to the voters in the upcoming November 7th election. General obligation bonds, also known as GO bonds, provide a mechanism for the city to fund the construction and rehabilitation of city facilities and infrastructure such as parks, libraries, fire stations, police precincts, community centers, streets and storm drains, and arts facilities. A GO bond program requires voter approval and cannot be used to fund operating costs like staff salaries or to fund assets in which the city has no legal interest. Phoenix voters have approved 12 GO bond programs since 1957, totaling $4.6 billion, with the last GO bond program approved by voters in 2006. This 17-year gap is the longest in the city's bond program history and has resulted in a significant amount of unfunded capital needs. In 2022, Phoenix City Council appointed a Citizens GO Bond Committee to identify the highest priority unfunded capital needs, totaling $500 million. In the fall, committee members met to review capital needs identified by city departments and heard proposals and input from the public. After three months of committee deliberation and extensive public input, the committee recommended a proposed $500 million GO bond program to Phoenix City Council. The City Council approved GO bond programs include projects in the areas of arts and culture, economic development and education, environment and sustainability, 
housing, human services, and homelessness, neighborhoods and city services, parks and recreation, public safety, and streets and storm drainage. The program includes projects such as a new Latino cultural center, acquiring land for Rio Reimagined, affordable housing property preservation, a new senior and recreation center, new regional pools, and improvements to existing community centers and park facilities, funding for heat resiliency projects, Vision Zero roadway safety initiatives, new and expanded library branches, and new and renovated fire stations throughout the city to improve response times. The full list of projects and programs is available on the city's website at phoenix.gov bond. Voters will decide the outcome of the city council approved GO bond program during a November 7th, 2023 bond election. Election materials, including an informational pamphlet with more detail about the bond program, will be mailed to all voters in the fall ahead of the election. So uh, the first card is going to be by Ginny Ann Sumner, but before I have her come up here, she's been a neighborhood leader for many, many years. We've known each other probably for 20 plus years. So when you saw up there the crosscut canal, she was critical on that. It shows you how active individuals can be to get things done. Many of you don't remember the, uh, the, the park, you remember it, it was, there, there was no park there and uh, we worked, I mean, what, maybe four or five years on this project. And now it's an amazing park that goes from McDowell all the way down to Indian School. And it's amazing. And it was a big open canal for many years. It was a health hazard, it was a problem. Now it's enhanced the community. It shows you what capital projects can do to a community. But it also shows you, and Ginny, Ann, come on up here, uh, do your thing, but I wanna, I think we should all give her a round of applause for all the work that she's done. So she's been active and she's been amazing to work with and we've known each other for quite a few years. Go ahead, you're up first. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio, thanks for your service on the council. I appreciate your help for neighborhoods, especially the, the Crosscut Park. And before the City of Phoenix had a, a speed humps program, you supported my crazy idea for corporations to pay for them with the adopt a hub program those speed humps are still in place thank you <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and soon to be councilman robinson i also address these concerns and respectfully ask your backing for them please <clears throat> i support the parks and recreation department hiring 14 new park rangers and one park manager to create an overnight third shift for the rangers to provide 24-hour coverage seven days a week and the hiring of additional uh, shifts one and two because we do not do not have enough park rangers to enforce the code of conduct today. Most of the time our parks are open, no park employee is present. And contracting and contacting the parks department is only available Monday through Friday during business hours. So I also support a 24 seven number for a park supervisor to be added to, the, to be added for visitors in our flatland parks. Most issues can be handled by a park ranger, but currently the only option is to call the police. At one point, park users were able to call the number called 262 Park, but that is no longer an option for us. I also support changing our bus stop benches to a septet design, please. Unfortunately, the gated alley programs and the pilot program to, find, to fund property cleanups place the burden on neighborhoods and on tax dollars. If I violate the neighborhood preservation ordinance and trash my yard or my alley, I'm subject to civil citation, contractual abatement, and criminal charges. As our mayor stated, homelessness is not a crime, but illegal behavior is, illegal regardless of your housing status. I'd like to see homeless solutions in the budget that actually identify the different types of homeless, homelessness and creates solutions accordingly. I support cutting back outreach funding for CBI and instead fund human services outreach teams. I support items one through five under the police, but it's alarming that the cost will be absorbed by utilizing funding from vacant sworn officer positions. I understand there's some discussion about stopping the My Phoenix 311 app. I think that would be a great disservice. We live in a world of apps. 
That app is a great tool for neighborhoods. As co-chair of the Citizens Law Enforcement Anti-Graffiti Initiative, a long name, yes, Cleegee, we shortened to, we support a software developer to help neighborhood services in getting a graffiti buster's permission slip available online that can be emailed back to neighborhood services. The post office isn't very responsive in, in returning the postcards, and currently the process is not user friendly. Thank you for considering this. Thank you, Aunt Jimmy. Uh, Craig Tripkin, next. Thank you, Councilman DeCicio, and thank you for your years of service. Uh, two terms. I, Two terms now and, and two terms back in the 90s. Is, am I right about that? Or three Maybe terms a little now? longer. A little longer. Craig, Craig and I used to serve together back in the 90s, and he was great to work with. Councilman elect, congratulations, and I look forward to, to working with you. I'm, I'm here representing a new leaf, and we are looking, we are requesting that the city uh, give our Phoenix Day Early Childhood Education Center $250,000 in one time funds. Uh, we understand, I understand that the ongoing funds are difficult. <clears throat> Just to put it, well, let me back up. A new leaf uh, provides emergency homeless services, uh, emergency shelter. In fact, I think we've got probably before Washington was opened up the second largest single adult set shelter in the region. Uh, we provide housing, domestic violence services, which relates to homelessness, job training, early education, after school programs, et cetera. And th let me explain what happened, what we're doing with uh, Phoenix Day, uh, Early Childhood Education Center. We, COVID hammered this facility. The census dropped, the number of kids dropped to the mid 40s. And it's hard to retain teachers, it's hard to keep people trained, and that sort of thing. So basically, we were looking at a million dollar deficit uh, uh, about a year, well, a year, and a year and some months ago. And we made a plan, and we're fulfilling our part of the plan. And that plan said we're going to get our census of kids. We started, when we made the plan, we were at 65 kids, we were going to get our census up to, to 80 kids, uh, and, and we've done that. We're going to be at 120 by June, and again, we're we're well on the way to doing that. In fact, we're over 80. Yeah, I just I just use that number, and then we're going to be at 121 by by let's say next spring, and at that point, uh, we will we are we will be provably sustainable. Uh, the city's help getting us over this hump, this COVID hump, getting the training and teachers trained. Uh, and that sort of thing is going to do wonders for, for us being a sustainable thing in the future. Donors want to see this. And frankly, we need to go to donors and say, uh, with the city's help, we are, uh, we're, we're breaking even at least. We're not losing so much that we, we have to worry about the future of the facility. And so a one time $250,000 is what we'd like to ask you for. And I certainly appreciate your support. And I, and I repeat myself, which I do. Uh, I'd like to say we're doing our part. We made a plan, and we're doing our part to get there. And you can count on us to continue to do our part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. And just as a, an aside, too, Craig is probably, not probably, he is the most versed person when it comes to homeless issues on how to deal with homelessness and has been actively involved for maybe 15 years now or more uh, in the homeless issue. I remember when we even served in the 90s, Craig made that his top priority. So I don't think that there's a person in the city that understands it and has been involved as long as he has. And one more thing too on these nonprofits, they are run by angels. They don't make much money at all. And they are individuals that did, have dedicated their lives, their entire lives, and their families to helping others. And whether it's homeless uh, shelters or those that run these domestic violence shelters, literally they make virtually nothing. And all they do is care about what's happening in their community and what happens to these souls that they take in. Um, Rick Engelman.
Good morning. Um, I just want to first thank you for um, the support that you provide for the public arts program in the current budget and the previous budgets. You walk around the city of Phoenix, you drive around the city of Phoenix, and there's beauty everywhere now. I'd like to encourage the council to expand on that program. The new project manager position is, a, is a much needed. You know, and if additional support can be provided for additional artists to make the city even more beautiful, then I encourage that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Sally Boyle. You're all in a row. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Sally Boyle. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live in District 8. But it's just a mile away that I live from Devonshire, so I thought I'd come to this meeting <laughs> out of convenience. I'm a Phoenix native, an artist, an art educator, a grandma, and a Phoenix Arts and Culture Commissioner. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think, <clears throat> excuse me, about the arts. I grew up in Phoenix, and the city used to be kind of an arts wasteland. We had Barry Goldwater's beautiful Kachina collection at the Goldwater Department Store, and we had Paul Coase's lovely mural at the Sky Harbor Airport. And that was pretty much it for our public arts. But today, because of the vision of the Phoenix City Council, we can drive into many neighborhoods and public spaces and see beautiful, interesting, and sometimes challenging art. Visitors coming to Sky Harbor are able to enjoy the second largest uh, airport museum in the United States, true. which is quite an amazing feat all because of the shared vision of the Phoenix City Council and the Arts Commission. Imagine how many of the Super Bowl attendees took selfies in front of that mural downtown, like taking it home to their friends. What I'm asking for is for you to increase the funding of the Commission's art program this year. With these funds, the arts will help sustain a healthy cultural workforce, retain talent, and provide cultural programming in every council district. In the long term, the city council should consider moving towards a $1 per capita spending on the arts grant funding annually. That would be $1.7 million. That's a $50,000 increase from its current allocation. It would do a lot for our arts and culture. We have an award-winning public arts program that really focuses on our neighborhoods. The Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture has around a dozen projects on the horizon. They're gonna keep us very busy. And we need a larger staff to take on more opportunities to make Phoenix an even greater place to live, work, visit. Thank you so much for your support of the culture and the arts that we're trying to provide here and for all that you're doing for our dear city. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And one of the things that we were able to do with the arts program too was uh, incorporate functionality with art so that it became useful to individuals that were there. And that, that's been, we started that back, I think late, late 90s with Craig is one of the things that we did. And by doing that, now more people are be able to, to enjoy the art that's out there. Not only just be able to see it, but be able to enjoy and use it. Uh, Sa Sally was there, David Bickford. Thank you, Ms. Montez, Councilman DeCicio, Councilman-elect Robinson. Good to see you all here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and listening to my concerns as a District 6 resident. I'm pleased with several elements of the proposed budget, including better compensation for city employees and enhanced security at our parks. My comments today are not intended to question any of the intended spending in the budget, but instead call for consideration of additional priorities related to transportation. First, I'd like to highlight a long overdue project right here in District 6. I frequently ride my bicycle along the Arizona Canal. However, there is a glaring infrastructure gap through the Biltmore and Arcadia neighborhoods. West of 24th Street, canal users enjoy the underpasses of the Diversion Channel. East of 60th Street, where the canal crosses into Scottsdale, there is a paved path with lighting and safe crossings of arterial streets. In between, however, we have only an unpaved path starting at 24th Street all the way to 60th Street. It has no lighting and dodgy crossings at the major streets. I urge you to make filling this gap a high priority with a defined timeline for design and construction over the next five years. Looking at other areas of the city within District 6, 
There is a plan for enhanced bike lanes on 20th Street. I would like to see that proceed as expeditiously as possible, as well as additional construction of protected bike lanes on 3rd Street downtown, linking to the new federally funded Rio Salado Bridge. In terms of other transportation priorities, I would like to see light rail headways restored to the original level of 10 minutes between trains that we enjoyed when service began back in 2008. I know from my daily commute, which is in part via light rail, that the trains are now crowded again as on-site work and major events return from the pandemic. Passengers deserve better service, not only for purposes of convenience, but also because overcrowded trains are more likely to lead to disputes over personal space that may require a security response. It is long overdue to work with our partner cities of Tempe and Mesa to define a plan for enhanced frequency of rail service, particularly as we anticipate the opening of additional miles of track in 2024, just next year. When the current single line is split into two intersecting lines, some passengers who previously have enjoyed a single seat ride to Sky Harbor Airport, Tempe or Mesa, will now have to transfer at the new downtown hub. Those transfers will be far less burdensome and far less of a deterrent to discretionary passengers if they involve waits of no more than 10 minutes. Finally, although I am pleased to have a flexible schedule that allows me to participate in this first of a series of in-person meetings, I realize many Phoenix residents do not have the same privilege. I would therefore ask that you add a virtual meeting rather than just an online comment form or the budgeting tool, as helpful as it is, to the current schedule. Thank you all for your time today. I wish you the best as you proceed with the challenging and somewhat thankless task of arriving at a budget. Thank you, David. And one of the projects that you might be thinking about as well is many years ago, I worked with Salt River Project to put in the Arizona Falls. And if you haven't seen the Arizona Falls, it is amazing. And it's one of the most beautiful things we have in the city of Phoenix, and very few people get a chance to see it. So if you haven't had a chance to go on the canals, I believe that's just east of 56th Street. Um, and I want to thank Salt River Project. That was a difficult project at the time when we, were, when we approached them on it. And they put in a considerable amount of money. Money came in from the city of Phoenix to be able to get that accomplished. And it's now one of the, one, one of the more beautiful things that we have in our district. Um, thank you, David, for that comment, too. Just reminded me, too, about the, the walkways. I used to hike that quite a bit. Or not hike it, just walk it, because not much of a hike. It's a straight. And then uh, Deborah Larson. I'm not sure I need the microphone, but good morning, and thank you so much for holding this hearing. I'm Deborah Larson. I'm a resident of District 6 since 1987, and I am here to advocate for the arts. I just want to talk to you a little bit about the joy of the arts. I've had the opportunity to be the chairman of the Phoenix Boys Choir and the Herbert Theater. I'm just the former chair of that now. And it's such joyful things to see little Head Start children come in, dance on the stage for the first time, skip as they leave the theater because they've experienced something they've never experienced before. You saw the families on Roosevelt Row looking at the murals, telling the story that the artists had told to their families. You see people walking out of the uh, buildings and touching the sculptures around town, trying to decide what they are. We just see more joy in our community, more opportunity for people to have social di discussions about things that are happening. And so, you know, Phoenix has a very low arts budget, you know, Houston, and who wants to live there has $6 million a year. So let's up our game. We're better than Houston. And thank you so much for running our great city. So one of the things, Deborah, that you brought up just reminded me of the past. I've been a strong supporter of the arts, as you know. Uh, and it's not that I know anything about art, because I don't. I don't pretend to, but I do know the value of it in our community. When I was in uh, fifth grade, I, I'm, able, I'm able to memorize stuff, and I can remember things. So Tchaikovsky's play for, the, the, what is it, the Christmas, um, Christmas oh, what was it? Cracker. Christmas, the yeah. Nutcracker. The Nutcracker, yeah. So my, it was my first experience at Grady Gamage at the time. We won it, and we were able to go there, and I thought, God, this is how it, you know, we grew up really poor, so my parents could never have afforded right. that. And by going there, when you talk about the Head Start kids, I guarantee you that is gonna leave an imprint on their lives forever because I came out of there thinking this is how people live. I didn't even know these things existed. 
And it was because of that experience that I had that I, I remembered that since fifth grade. So Just you're a exactly comment. right. Um, you know, everybody knows Emma Stone, right? She's yeah. our claim to fame. Yeah. And when she was on Broadway, they said, isn't this the best stage you've been on? She said, no, I've been on the Herberger stage. Yeah. And she was on the Herberger stage with Bella Youth Theater. Yeah. So that's awesome. But thank you. And everyone come. It's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Deborah, for all your help and your work. Uh, Michael Hughes. Thank you, Council Member DeCicio, Council Member Elect Robinson, Deputy City Manager. Uh, my name is Michael Hughes, and I am the CEO of A New Leaf. And I am very proud to say that I've been in that position for 45 years. Wow. And I'm here today to echo Mr. Tripkin's uh, comments on the support we need for Phoenix Day. But I'd like to actually come from a, a different angle. I. I'm a former elected official myself. I had the pleasure of serving on the Mesa School Board for 20 years. And I can tell you firsthand the importance of education. I can also relate to the theme when a New Leaf numbers come out and we see that about 30,000 people we helped last year. One theme that is very constant is the theme of the lack of education. Education is the key, the threshold, to being successful in our society. And never is it more paramount and important than in Phoenix Day. I want you to know, and I am proud to say, that we have a 90 to 95 percent kindergarten ready program in place. And that difference is key to those children having a successful uh, life ahead of them. I also would like you to know that we are putting in place a, a task force where this structural deficit will be taken care of. We took over Phoenix Day five years ago. And for those of you who do not know, Phoenix Day is over 100 years old. And we are very committed to making this program work. And we are well on our way. But this one-time funding will make a huge difference in us being able to not worry about yesterday but being able to take care of tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time and consideration and giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Sure. Thank you again. So did you serve with Tom Rhodes? Yes, I did. Tom's an amazing individual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were considered to be one of the most active school boards at one point. Right. I don't know if you still are or not, but I do know at one time it was the school board to have because yeah. of the active level yeah. of everybody there. So congratulations to you for doing it, laying such a strong foundation. Thank you. Thank you, know, you, sir. You bet, Michael. Thank you for all the help that you do for Phoenix. And then Rusty Foley, haven't seen you in a while. Once, once a year, I think. Thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, today. And let me add my congratulations and, and best wishes, uh, Councilman DeCici. I hope you enjoy a little extra free time in your yes. life now. Yeah. And uh, welcome to uh, Councilman-elect uh, Kevin Robinson. Uh, as I think, I think you two gentlemen know, I'm a lifelong Arizonan. The majority of that time, I've been a resident of District 6. I, uh, I, I remember the days that uh, a previous commenter uh, uh, referenced when there was uh, very little in the way of the cultural amenities that we enjoy today. But l growing up here, I, uh, I have to say I've, I've enjoyed what we have had over the years and am very proud of uh, Phoenix and how those, how those institutions have, have grown and thrived and, and the amazing, vibrant community of individual artists that make Phoenix their home as well. Uh, currently, I'd say I'm also president of Friends of Phoenix Public Art. Uh, a nonprofit whose mission is to promote the value, maintenance, and support for our uh, internationally known, award-winning, and amazing public art program that enhances our community. So, of course, I do endorse uh, the uh, $125,000 increase in the budget, uh, in the trial budget. It's a healthy increase. Um, but uh, to echo previous comments, it really is, frankly, only a good start to what our city could and should invest in the nonprofit arts community. Uh, likewise, a staff position 
to help manage the public art program really is essential to maintaining the investment that we have made uh, in, in terms of dollars and an effort and, and, and the value that uh, those installations uh, uh, provide in so many different parts of our city. Uh, so finally, I just want to add another point here. You know, the most recent data from 2017 demonstrates that the Phoenix nonprofit arts and community contributes about $401 million to our local economy. That's $164 million in direct spending by arts organizations, leveraged by another $237 million that's spent by audiences uh, who attend, you know, the patrons. Uh, that's, a, that's an amazing 143% return on investment. Uh, on the other hand, and in addition, though, the city's modest but important investment helps ensure that these arts organizations and, and individual artists uh, are able to make their work available and accessible to all of our, all of our residents. That is the value of the nonprofit arts community as differentiated to for-profit uh, arts organizations and, and, and theaters, as wonderful as they are, not always as accessible. Uh, so the accessibility that public investment uh, makes uh, to the arts ensures that all of our citizens benefit and enjoy those amenities. Thank you very much. So I want to say something about Rusty and those other individuals that were here uh, advocating for the arts is that because they've made it such a strong focus in the city of Phoenix, if you remember, we didn't have a whole lot at one point. Nope. And because of the, the focus that they've had, making us focus on that. Because, you know, as an elected official, sometimes you'll find out you get very distracted because it's the last person that talked to you, but the consistency that they've had in the push that they've had, and people like Rusty and the others that spoke today and their active levels, it's made a different focus in the city of Phoenix. And because of that, we're a better place. And we are. I mean, if you look around, you, you look at the things that we have. I mean, one individual was talking about it earlier. It's, you know, people taking snapshots. You never saw that before. And, you know, we have to be a well-rounded community. That doesn't mean that we're focused on one or just two things in the city. We're focused on many things that make our community better, whether it's parks, the arts, especially the great police officers that they do. I mean, thank you for everything that you do. I want to give one hand of applause to our police department. They are amazing. They are the best that we've ever seen. Thank you for everything that you do. Um, they're under a lot of pressure right now. We are short, you know, depending on who you talk to, but we're short over 1,100 police officers. And it's just a very difficult thing right now for, the, for what they go through, their lives, their families. And I just want to give them a special recognition. Everyone deserves recognition, but for the amount of stress that they're going through right now, protecting us and making sure that, we're fa that our families are safe and they risk their lives every single day. Thank you. God bless you. We've been blessed by God to have you work, for, work with us. Thank you. Um, anything else, Gina? I have to turn this back over to her. Thank you for everything that uh, everyone's been involved in. <coughs> This is um, all the speakers, and um, thank you, Councilman, um, Councilman-elect. And that's all we have for um, this morning. I want to thank everyone for participating and providing feedback on the FY 2023-24 proposed trial budget. And this concludes our hearing.